Welcome back to Great Day for this Wednesday. Lou, Jackie, and Jason being joined by the one and only Rake of the Soup from the Des Moines Register. Time for Rake's Voice. Good morning. Let's see what's on your mind this morning. What is on my Many things are on my mind this morning. My gosh, Hillary Clinton has mm -hmm. declared. Galen's food. Mistake. Don't forget that. <laughs> brisket. Yeah. Oh, my God. Brisket, brisket salsa. salsa is the most amazing, amazing yeah, delicious, thing. Delicious, delicious. So how do you feel about Fabulous. Hillary really quick? How do I feel about her? I mean, I, I'm a little disappointed that she's doing these very small circles because I would have loved to hear her address a large audience and talk about her major priorities. I actually wanted to go today to the gathering in Norwalk, but they're only allowing two people from the register. I mean, they're really limiting the press because there's so much press from all over the country. Yeah, but so, you're so high up on the yeah, totem pole. Yeah, apparently you not the high line. enough. Well, they have political, specifically political oh. columnist and a political oh. reporter at the register, and I'm an all-purpose columnist. So... Next time, I hope to get a chance to chat with so her. So you don't th but think this is her message of connecting to the average person and, and the middle class by doing these small... I think it is, Function. but I also, and I think that for her it will certainly pay off, you know, to do it in these small segments because she can't be questioned that much and she's still maybe formulating her message. But I, from my point of view, I, I think it's disappointing because I'd like to see her interacting with a large crowd and answering questions and see how she wows the crowd if she does, you know, what the feel is, what the charisma is, what the vibe is. It's just, it's, you know... That's how I first got excited about Barack Obama, was seeing him interact with a large crowd and getting them Did on their feet. Did you go to the Hilton Coliseum deal when you went up there? Yeah, yeah. I went to, well, no, not in Hilton Coliseum. I went uh, when he came with Oprah Winfrey, when she showed up okay. here and spoke for him. It was at the Wells Fargo or, you know, one of those places mm. in Des Moines. I don't remember what it was called at the time. But anyway, that was when I really thought, this man has the momentum. He has the fire in the belly, and he can get a crowd really riled up. Now, she has a different style. It's definitely more low-key. Um, and I think she's also kind of highlighting the grandmother part of her life these days, which it just is a kind of kinder, gentler, softer style. Right. But I want to hear more about her priorities. I don't want to hear her listening so much. I want to hear her talking. So, now, as, as someone who uh, uh, changed parties to Democrat so that I could caucus for Barack Obama you did? to try and keep Hillary Clinton out of office. You realize did? that this is my worst nightmare. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so why is so Hillary hard. your worst nightmare? I'm just, it, it's neither here nor there, but uh, it's just a, a, a difference of philosophies. But I, I, I find it interesting uh, how she's changed her image, and I think she knows after uh, how she left us last time that mm -hmm. she really has to make an effort here in Iowa yeah. because she did leave a perception that she wasn't a big fan of the state. Left a bad taste in a lot I think of that's people's mouths. Yeah. She didn't, yeah, she didn't spend a lot of time, but I think she felt like she was a non-starter here. And the interesting thing is that the polls have consistently shown her in Iowa and everywhere across the country, you know, way outpacing any other Democratic mm -hmm. candidate, especially any other Republican with women. candidates. So, especially with women. Although there's some women on the sort of progressive left who I've spoken to who are increasingly wanting to hear her make a more sharpened sort of an attack on corporate power and on, you know, money and interests and politics and she says that that will be campaign finance reform will be one of her priorities we'll see if that mm -hmm. happens and I certainly hope that folks will you know continue to press her on that mm -hmm. issue if I get a chance to talk to her I definitely will what do you think of the whole we don't need another Clinton or another Bush in office. I, I, there's a strong part of me that agrees with that. I mean, I think that sort of the era of the Clintons and of the Bushes should, in some ways, you know, needs to come to a natural end because there is this sense of kind of entitlement and you know too much of the same family in office for too long um, that they get sort of too comfortable in their positions and they don't feel like they owe as much to the public because they have that family anointment kind of status. Right. So that bothers me. But actually, that's not what I was going to talk about today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what are we talking preamble. about today then? Um, so this blows my mind. This is one of the most absurd and out outrageous things I have ever even imagined, which is the following. If you rape a woman and you get her pregnant, in about 17 to 19 states in America, you can sue for joint custody oh, of the child that is born as a result of that rape. Can you believe it? And Iowa is one of those states. Wow. I was one of the states. We have no law that is an outright bar to um, getting parental rights to the child. Does so, this happen very often? 
Well, we don't know the incidents, but we do. There is a woman, and 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 this is how this came to my attention in this weird roundabout way, where what's comedy, what's news, what's reality? It was on John Stewart last week. Hmm. There was a woman who was interviewed who spent two years fighting a case like this. She was a rape survivor, and her rapist sued for um, parental custody rights, and she fought it and fought it and fought it so hard that she ended up going to law school and becoming a lawyer. And now she's trying to make the case that. The majority of states do not have outright bars to that. She has subsequently succeeded in getting a number of states to change their policies. So I believe at least 31, maybe 32 now, do have outright bars to it. But Iowa is not one of them, and wow. we're in a minority. And I mean, if you just imagine what that would look like, you know, that you that you are a subject of this violent encounter with this man you never want to see again, and then you can never get him out of your life because he keeps hanging around and he has legal rights to the child. So you have to negotiate with him over parent-teacher conferences and over what religion the kid is going to be raised with and how much homework they have to do every night. And, you know, um, I mean, everything about values, allowances. Can you imagine that? And you know, one of the insidious things that, that happens, according to this woman, is that he can say, um, if you drop criminal prosecution of me, then I'll back off of suing you for uh, child custody. Oh, so he really? uses it as a leverage point. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. So he may not even want to raise that child, but he can use that as a tactic to get criminal. And then, you know, what happens is, under our law, if you move 150 miles away with a child, if, if it's, you know, a child of divorce mm -hmm. and there are two parents separately, um, then that can change the judge's determination on who gets primary physical custody. So imagine if she tries to get away from her attacker, then he might get primary custody because she's trying to leave the state and get away from him. Wow. I mean, the mind just boggles about wow. this. So, um, so there is a federal uh, law that has been proposed by um, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, a Democratic uh, representative um, from Florida, and it would provide financial incentives to states um, that would pass a law like this, saying no mm. custody mm -hmm. for the rapist father. Uh. Um, but it's it's met some resistance because of the financial. So it would it would cost like five million dollars a year for five years, which is really not that much money when you think about it. But there's mm. been opposition to spending that kind of money on it. Jeez. There was also a bill that was. Um, introduced this year in the Iowa House um, by a Republican, actually a Republican representative, that would, that would ban custody rights. But one of the sticking points here is how do you prove rape? So few rape cases get prosecuted and end up in convictions that if you use conviction of rape as the threshold, then, you know, it's just going to apply to a tiny, tiny mm -hmm. fraction of those people who are in this situation. Right. So there's another, um, there's another threshold, which is clear and convincing evidence, and there's some question about how the law should be framed. Her bill says on a rape conviction, but other activists and advocates for battered women and rape survivors are saying it should be clear That's and convincing fair. Yeah, evidence. Change the verbiage exactly. a little bit, yeah. Exactly. What is really interesting about this particular bill and legislation generally across the country on this is that it is promoted by um, Republican and pro-life people because they don't want the idea of a rapist having a say over sure. child rearing to be, you know, a reason why a woman wouldn't carry. Oh yeah. Yeah, wouldn't carry the pregnancy to term. So absolutely. So there, but it's a good grounds for you know coalition building between Democrats and Republicans, and I really hope that next year it. it comes to we do something about so that's it. all in today's paper that's today's paper there you go exactly. wonderful good job thank you so thank much thank you Rachel. it's 10 minutes before nine o'clock we're going to head over to the great day